Okay, so we are picking up where we left off in this section 4.2 on extreme values. So we've got a few values here, a few examples. We're going to find maximum and minimum values again. So we've got the same three steps. Step one, find the critical points. So the way that we find the critical points is by finding the derivative and then either finding where the derivative is zero or undefined. Don't forget about the undefined part. So critical points. We're going to start with y prime. y prime is going to require a nice little quotient rule here. So quotient rule, we've got low d high. So low is x minus 4. d high is the derivative of x squared plus 1. That's a 2x. Minus high d low, the derivative of x minus 4 is just 1. And then all over low, low. Okay, so let's simplify that up. Let me just write a little bit of work up here. So when I distribute this 2x, I get 2x squared minus 8x, and then I'm subtracting the quantity x squared plus 1. So it'll be a negative 1 since I'm subtracting it. So let's clean up the numerator a little bit. So I have a 2x squared minus an x squared. That gives me an x squared. And then I have a negative 8x, and then I have no constants over here, but then I subtract 1, so minus 1. And then all of that over the x minus 4 quantity squared. All right, so let's play around with this a little bit, see what I can come up with. So maximum and mil minimum values on that function. Okay, so what I want to do here is on the interval from 5 to 6, so let's figure out where our derivative is equal to 0 and where our derivative is undefined. Okay, so start with undefined, because that's the one that we always forget about. If our denominator is equal to 0, this piece right here, that means that our function is undefined. So that happens when x equals 4. The derivative is undefined when x equals 4, but it doesn't fall on our interval. So we actually just cancel that option out immediately. It does not fall on the interval from 5 to 6. So when the derivative is equal to 0, that means that that's when x squared minus 8x plus 1 is equal to 0. All right, so let's start with that. So x squared minus 8x minus 1 is equal to 0. This does not factor. There's nothing that multiplies to 1 and adds to 8. And so what I do is I set up the quadratic formula. Check it out. So x equals negative b, so that's 8, plus or minus the square root of b squared is 64, and then minus 4 times 1 times negative 1. So that would be a negative 4, so plus 4 under here. And then all that over 2a. All right, so let's see what we end up with. We'll get some nice little values here. All right, so we have 8, let's start with 8 plus the square root of 68 over 2. Okay, that one's out because that's 8. I'm going to write it down anyways, but 8.123 doesn't count because it's not in our interval. And let's do minus. So 8 minus the square root of 68 and then put that over 2. And that is a negative 0 0.123. And that actually doesn't count either. So I do have critical points, but none of them are on the interval, so none of them count. That was still step one, though. We still had to go through that whole process, find the critical points. Next, we're supposed to calculate the function value at the critical points and at the endpoints. So I'm going to set up a little table, a little xy table. All I'm going to plug in here are the endpoints. I'm going to plug in the 5, I'm going to plug in the 6. That's really all I can do. So that means that my minimum will be at either one of the endpoints and my maximum will be at either one of the endpoints. All, that, all of this means is that I don't have any critical points on this interval. I do have critical points, just not on the interval. So I plug the 5 in. 5 squared plus 1 is 26. And then over 5 minus 4 is 1. So 26. When I plug in 6, 6 squared plus 1 gives me 37. And then over 6 minus 4 gives me 2. All right, so I've got 26 over 1, which of course is just 26. And then 37 over 2 is 18 and a half. So my minimum value is when I plug 6 into my original function, I get 18 and a half. My maximum value is when I plug 5 into the function and I get 26. So I had a double endpoint extrema, no critical point extrema. Okay, let's look at another one here. Maximum and minimum values. Step one, find the critical points. So you find the critical points by taking the derivative. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then plus the derivative of sine is cosine. So first we want to find out when that derivative is undefined. That's one way that I could have critical points. Sine and cosine are never undefined. They're completely continuous functions. So the next thing I do is I set that equal to 0. 
So that means I am looking for anywhere where cosine is equal to sine. We need to know our unit circle values. It is never, ever going to go away. If you have not learned them yet, learn them now. So when cosine is equal to sine, that happens in the pi over 4 family members. So when theta is equal to pi over 4, they're both root 2 over 2. Um, in 3 pi over 4, we have one positive and one negative root 2 over 2, so that doesn't count. At 5 pi over 4, they're both negative root 2 over 2, so they're exactly the same. And then at 7 pi over 4, one's positive, one's negative, so that one doesn't count. So we've got two critical points here. They both fall on the interval, so I count them both. Step two is I calculate the function value at both the critical points and at the endpoints. So I'll set up a nice little table here. So I have critical points, pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. So the extrema, the absolute max and the absolute min, might happen at one of the critical points or it might happen at one of the endpoints. All right, so those are my options. So I am going to plug these values into my original function because I want to know when the original function has the largest or the smallest value. So when I plug into my original function, pi over 4, cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. Sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So let's do like a little bit of side work in here. So root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2. They have a common denominator, so I can add them together. I actually just get root 2. So here at 5 pi over 4, I have negative root 2 over 2 plus negative root 2 over 2. By the same process, that would give me a negative root 2. When I plug in 0, cosine of 0 is 1. Sine of 0 is 0. So 1 plus 0 gives me 1. And then when I plug in 2 pi, I actually get the exact same values because 2 pi and 0 are at the same spot. So the cosine of 2 pi is 1. Sine of 2 pi is 0. So that gives me a 1. So keep in mind... These irrational values, square root of 2 is somewhere around 1.4. Okay, so when I come up with these values, my minimum value is at 5 pi over 4 when my function value is negative root 2. My maximum value happens at pi over 4 when my function value is a positive root 2. Okay, so minimum and maximum values. So that must have happened at those peaks and valleys and not at the endpoints of the function. So that's, let's actually look at one of these examples, just because I'm sure you're probably wondering what on earth these mins and max problems look like. So here's a graph. So I'm going to plot cosine plus sine. Okay, so here's the function cosine plus sine. I'm going to change the window so that it's the exact window we wanted. So change the window. We are going to do, I think trig should actually work perfectly. Eh, whatever, close enough. This still takes me, so here's 0, and then the 6.28, that's 2 pi. So if I look here, here is one of my critical points, right there, and that's because the derivative was 0. Here is one of my critical points, and that's because the derivative is 0. If I look from, and then here's my endpoint, this is at 0. And then over here at 6.28, that is my other endpoint, right at the edge of the graph. So if you're looking for the very highest and the very lowest value, this is the very highest value, so that must be pi over 4. This is the very lowest value, so that must be 5 pi over 4. The endpoints are not the very highest or the very lowest points, which we found when we plugged in those critical points and endpoints into the function. Okay, so one more of these. One last practice with finding extreme values. Step one, find the critical points. So I find y prime. So the derivative of 3e e to the x is just 3e e to the x. Because 3 is just a constant. And then, we you know, best derivative ever. And then minus the derivative of e to the 2x. This one requires a chain rule. So the main function is e. Its derivative is still just e to, you know, the u. So here u is a 2x. And then times the derivative of the nested function, the derivative of 2x is 2. So this is 3e to the x and then minus 2e to the 2x. These are not like terms. I cannot combine them as if they were like terms. All I can do is set this equal to 0 and solve. And this is going to be some very fun like pre-calc, algebra sort of stuff that we're doing here. So add this term to both sides. So I get 3e to the x equals 2e to the 2x. I'm attempting to solve for x. So watch what I do here. Let's first divide by... We're going to divide by e to the x. 
so I can get all my x's isolated. And then what I'm going to do is I actually want to move this 2 over here. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2 as well. So these 2's will cancel. These e to the x's will cancel. And I will have 3 halves on the left equals, and then I have e to the 2x divided by e to the x. What I do is I subtract those powers, and I just have e to the x. Okay, so we're getting there, we're cleaning up, we're simplifying. Last thing to remember, and like I said, this is an algebra thing, the way that you get e to the x by itself here is you take the natural log of both sides. So when we take the natural log of the left, it's just natural log of 3 halves, whatever that is, and then equals, when I take the natural log of e to the x, those are inverses of each other, natural log and e to the x are, and so they cancel each other out and I just have x. Okay, so natural log of 3 halves, we probably don't know what that is, so let's double check if it's in the interval. So, calculator page, so let's get the natural log of 3 halves, and that is, whoops, that's not very clear, there we go, that is about 0 0.4, 0 0.4 definitely falls in my interval. So that critical point counts in terms of the interval that we were given, so let's set up a little table. So I have the natural log of 3 halves, and then I have the endpoints, negative 1 half, and then 1. So this is going to be some algebra fun, that we're going to plug these values in. So let's first plug in the natural log of 3 halves. So little side work over here. Eh, you know what? I'm going to just do it in the calculator. No big deal. Alright, so my function is 3, and then e to the x. Oops, not natural log. E to the x. So here's where I plug in the natural log of 3 halves and then minus e to the 2x, so 2 times the natural log of 3 halves. Okay, so we plug that in. That's my critical point. I get 2.25. All right, nice neat value there. 2.25. Okay, then let's plug in the negative 1 half. So 3 e to the negative 1 half and then minus e to the, then when I plug in negative one-half times two, I get negative one. Okay, so, whoops, why is this not clear? Come on. There we go. Okay, so this gives me about 1.452. Remember, that's just an approximation. I'll deal with that in a moment. And then when I plug in one, so three to the, clear up, clear up e to the x, so I'm plugging in 1, and then minus e to the 2x, so that would be squared. Okay, so 0 0.766 approximately. Okay, so now when I get my max and my min, my minimum value is the function defined at 1, that's one of the endpoints, that's this value right here. I want to write the exact value rather than writing this decimal approximation. So let's just write 3e, which is 3e to the first, and then minus e squared. So that's the exact value. If I were to plug that in, I would get this. And then my maximum occurs at the natural log of 3 halves. The reason this came out so nice and neat is because when I plug natural log functions into exponential functions, things get really nicely cleaned up. So 2.25, that is 2 and 1 quarter, which is 9 quarters. Let's get a nice neat value there. So those are our maximum and minimum values. We use the endpoints as well as the critical points. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to be working with here is something called Rolle's Theorem. So Rolle's Theorem is going to take us into the mean value theorem, which we're going to do in the next lesson. So Rolle's Theorem, let's write it down. So we start with some assumptions. Assume that f of x is continuous on a to b. Okay, so assume that f of x is continuous on a to b. That part is very important. And differentiable on a to b. Okay, these are our assumptions. Big key difference. We can be continuous on a closed interval, but we can't be differentiable on a closed interval because we don't know what's happening to the left of A or to the right of B. So that's why we're continuous on the closed and differentiable on the open. So if f of A equals f of B, 
So if I have two of the same y values, then there exists a number c There exists a number C between A and B. Such that F prime of C equals zero. So lots of, I mean, what looks like crap probably when you're reading that through, just mathematical crap. So let's start with the beginning sentence. That part's easy. Assume f is continuous and differentiable. Continuous means no breaks, jumps, holes, asymptotes, anything like that. Differentiable means no corners, cusps, vertical tangent lines, anything like that. So if those two things are true, let's move on to the next sentence. If f of a equals f of b. So in other words, I'm not actually going to write this down in words. I'm just going to draw you a little graph because I think that might help even more. So a little graph. So if f of a... So here's A, here's B. If f of A equals f of B, what that means is that their y values are the same. So if f of A equals f of B, there exists a number C between A and B, so somewhere on there, such as the derivative of C equals zero. So I'm going to draw multiple graphs on here. So I need to go from A to B, and I need to be continuous and differentiable. So we've got a couple of options here. You know, maybe... Maybe my graph is, you know, an upside-down parabola. Something like that. That's one option. Let me draw a few more on here. I'm going to color code. Let's say that my graph does something like this. That's an option. Let's say, at, at the very, very easiest case, that my graph actually just goes straight from A to B, just like a really boring horizontal line. Okay, so those are three different options, three different graphs where my graph is continuous and differentiable and my function values are the same here and here. Now, let's go to this. There exists a number C between A and B such that F prime of C equals zero. What this means is that somewhere on the interval, the derivative has to be zero. If my Y values here and here are the same, somewhere on the interval, the derivative has to be zero. So let's start with this first graph. Here, I go up, I go down. As long as I'm continuous and differentiable, I've got to have a slope of zero on there somewhere. Happens right about there. The green graph that I drew, there are multiple places where the derivative is, e is equal to zero. I'm continuous, I'm differentiable. It doesn't matter how I get from A to B. This one actually had one, two, three points where my derivative would be equal to zero. Then, of course, I've got that red graph. On that red graph, the derivative is always equal to zero. So we've got multiple options there. You could have at least one point where the derivative is zero, and that's if the graph either goes up and then comes back down, or goes down and comes back up, or your line could go straight across, or it could wiggle up and down. We could have multiple derivatives of zero. But that's what Rolle's theorem says. If I start with one y value and end at the same y value, there's going to be a slope of zero somewhere. And that value of c, you know, on the black graph, for instance, that value of c would be this one right here. There's got to be a c in between a and b such that f prime of c equals zero. All right, let's look at some applications of Rolle's theorem. Okay, so verify Rolle's theorem. To verify Rolle's theorem, that just means basically proving that it actually works. So proving it on the interval. So let's start with being continuous and being differentiable. So f of x equals sine x. Sine x is continuous and differentiable. Here's what we could do though. If we say f of x is differentiable, first of all, we don't even need to mention the interval because f of x is always differentiable, no matter what interval I'm looking at. Sine, it doesn't do anything fancy, no corners, cusps, anything like that. And remember, to say that something is differentiable automatically implies that it's continuous. So I kind of get a two for one there. So we're going to start with that. Next, what I do is I need to show that f of a equals f of b. So next, I need to show that f of pi over 4 equals f of 9 pi over 4. Okay, so when I plug in pi over 4, sine of pi over 4 we should know this, equals root 2 over 2. And then sine of 9 pi over 4. 9 pi over 4 is actually in the exact same spot as pi over 4. I already went around the unit circle once, 
and then I go back to that same spot. So this is actually 9 pi over 4 and pi over 4 in the same spot on the unit circle. So of course they have the same value. So that works. That checks out. So I've got two of the same y values. So what that means is if I go from y value to y value, there must be a slope of zero in between. So when I say verify, that means find the point where the slope is zero. So f prime equals cosine. The derivative of sine is cosine. That means I've got to find a value of cosine that's equal to zero somewhere in between these. So cosine is equal to zero. Let's think about the unit circle. When is the x value equal to zero? The x value is equal to 0 at pi over 2, and at 3 pi over 2, we could keep going. Oops, that should be a 2. We could keep going around the unit circle, but these are the only two that fall in this one right here. So that's what we did. We verified that it was continuous and differentiable. We verified that the two y values were equal, and then we verified that somewhere on that interval, we have a slope of 0. We actually found two slopes of 0. All right, last example. Use Rolle's theorem to prove that this function right here has at least one root. All right, so let's walk through that. What we want to do is this is actually pretty similar to the, um, the intermediate value theorem where we found a value on one side and then found a value on the other. So we are going to talk about intermediate value theorem a little bit. Okay, so we want to find one negative y value, one positive y value. So we definitely have a positive y value when f or when x is zero. So f of 0 equals 1. So that's a positive y value. So that means your function is up above the x-axis at that point. So let's try let's try negative 1, because 1 is definitely going to be positive, because these things are all positive. So let's try negative 1. So negative 1 over 6 plus positive 1 over 2 and then minus 1 and then plus 1. So these ones cancel out. Eh, this one's going to overtake this one, so this one's still positive. So that's not good enough. Let's try negative 2. So if I plug in negative 2, I get negative 8 over 6, and then plus 4 over 2, which is 2, and then plus negative 2, and then plus 1. So these two will cancel out. Here we go. All right, so here, this negative 8 over 6 overtakes there we go. So we could even use these two as an example. So my graph is above the x-axis here, and then one unit later it's down below the x-axis. So that uses the intermediate value theorem. So by the intermediate value theorem, f of x has at least one root somewhere in that interval. So let's write this. By the intermediate value theorem, and that's because we know that this function is continuous. It's a polynomial. Oops, these should be in the other order, sorry. Negative 2 to negative 1, number line. So we know we've got at least one root here. So if, if f of x had a second root, let's talk about this. So at most one real root. So we think we found it right here. Having at most one real root means we have one and only one. So let's assume, maybe, just to see if we can prove it wrong. So let's say if f of x had a second root, let's call it b, then f of a would equal f of b would equal 0. So let me explain this. So if a root, we're calling this root a. So f of a is 0 because it's an x-intercept, it's a root. If we had a second root, then f of b would equal 0 as well. So we know that these two values are equal. That's when Rolle's theorem would apply. All right, so and Rolle's theorem, let's write this. Rolle's theorem would imply that f prime of c equals 0. For some c on the interval from a to b. All right, so let's walk through that really quickly. So we know we've got at least one root somewhere in here, and that's by the intermediate value theorem. First we're above the x-axis, then we're below the x-axis. There's got to be a root somewhere in there. So we know that we have one root, a, we're calling it a, 
somewhere on this interval from negative two to negative one. So what we're doing is we're saying, well, if we had a second root, let's call it B, the Y value at A would be zero, the Y value at B would be zero. That means these two have the same Y value. Any two points that have the same Y value, we can apply Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem says if two points have the same Y value, there's got to be a slope of zero in between. All right, so that's where we're at so far. We're saying if there's a second root, well, there's got to be a slope of zero somewhere in between those two points. And what we're going to do is conclude that it's not possible. All right, so we're going to take the derivative, see if there is a derivative of zero somewhere in there. So the derivative of this function right here, I get 1 half x squared and then plus x, and then plus 1. So this function right here, if we want to find a slope of 0, set that equal to 0. Let's do a little quadratic formula. So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times 1 half, that's 2, times 1, and all over 2a. So this right here, these are going to be imaginary. These are going to be imaginary. So that means that this function right here has no solution, or no real solution anyways. So here's what happened. Let's kind of work our way backwards. There is no slope of zero. There is no slope of zero, which means that Rolle's theorem didn't actually work. Well, Rolle's theorem always works, so that must mean that our assumption was incorrect. That must mean that there is no second root, because if there was a second root, believe me, Rolle's theorem would work. It always works. So since Rolle's theorem failed and there wasn't a derivative of zero, that must mean there isn't a second root which means that A, the one that we found here, is the only root. So conclusion, A is the only real root. Okay, so kind of a, an interesting little application of that theorem. All right, so that is the end of 4.2.